So what we're going to look at in this video is what's known as Boltzmann distribution curves. It sounds complicated but it, honestly it really isn't. It's just a curve that we use to show us how the energies of the particles are distributed within the sample. So we have the two axes, we've got the y-axis which is the number of particles and the energy axis is the x-axis. I'm just going to bring back something I used in a previous video where I talked about the reactions between the green particles and the red particles. So if you've already watched this video, then you'll know what I'm going on about here. So the, the, the size of these flashes next to the particles is a representation of their energy. So the first thing to point out is that every single particle, hope I haven't missed one out, I don't think I have, every single particle has got some energy. So that means that this distribution curve must start at the origin. So there are no particles with no energy. No particles with no energy. There are not very many, but there are a few particles with this one single flash. One, two, three, four. So four particles have got a small amount of energy on this diagram here. And then if we look at the the bigger flashes, one, two, three, so they're getting smaller now, these particles. So that these, these three here have got the most energy. And so not very many particles have a lot of energy. So the bulk of the particles, the majority of the particles, have got some energy in between. So I'll draw a distribution curve now and I'll come back to that. So there's the distribution curve. So I've started in the origin because there are no particles with zero energy. The number of particles with small amounts of energy, low, very low amounts of energy, is quite low. The majority of the particles, so that's these particles here, they have this sort of medium energy. And then as we get to the higher energy, then the number of particles is coming down. I'm going to talk about this part of the curve very shortly. So I've just summarised that there. So no particles have zero energy. Most particles have this medium energy. So these sort of energies here. And a few particles have high energy. Right, the reason why this curve must asymptote, so in other words it must not cross the x-axis, because if we did cross the x-axis, whoops, if we did cross the x-axis, if I do that, what we're saying is that there are no particles with any energy greater than this energy here. Now, that's not right because there is nothing, you know, there's nothing to say that there might be one or two particles with energy greater than this. And so therefore... We can't say that, we must asymptote the curve. So it must never touch the x-axis. So it's sort of just above, skimming the x-axis line, but never touching it. And the only other thing to mention at this point before we move on is that the total area under the curve, now don't panic, you won't have to calculate the area, the total area under the curve is the total number of particles in the sample. So if you've got a mole of a gas, let's say, you would have Avogadro's number of particles in the sample. None with no energy, a few with small energies, most of them with medium energies, and a few with high energies. But remember, we mustn't cross that x-axis at that point. So if we bring in the idea of activation energy into the Boltzmann curve, so if I say that the minimum amount of energy needed for a successful collision is here, 
So anything, any collisions with this amount of energy, it's not enough, so the reaction doesn't take place. Collisions that occur past this green line, that they will cause a reaction. So what we can do is if we extend the activation energy up so it cuts the curve, we can see now, I'll change colour, that this area under the curve after the activation energy, so higher than the activation energy, this area here is telling us the number of particles, remember the area under the curve is the number of particles, so the area under the curve after the activation energy, these are all particles that can react successfully. So this large area here, all of these particles, yes they're colliding, but they don't have enough energy. So these don't react, these are all the unsuccessful collisions, and these are all the successful collisions. So let's use the curve to explain how a catalyst performs its function. So remember we said earlier, the catalyst will provide an alternative route for the reaction with a lower activation energy. So if that's the activation energy for the reaction without a catalyst, then obviously the catalyzed reaction will have a lower activation energy. So we draw an activation energy here now. And straight away, you can see that all of these collisions, which weren't successful before, when the activation energy was that, these are all successful now. And so we've increased the area under the curve. And so we have all of these particles as well as those that can now react. So there are more successful collisions per second. So if we look at Boltzmann curves and temperature now, so we've got this black line representing the distribution of the particles um, at a medium temperature. So what I'm gonna do first is lower the temperature and obviously at a lower temperature, all of the particles have less kinetic energy than before. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift the curve to the left-hand side at the lower energy side of the um, energy axis. Now, my chemistry teacher used to have a little trick that he used to tell us to employ, and it works really well. If you think of this as a wire, then grab hold of the end of the wire and just push it to the lower energy and hopefully you can appreciate that the curve will do something like this so it's going to bunch up there and then it's going to come down asymptote like this okay now remember all we've done is change the temperature we haven't changed the amount of substance so the area under these two curves the total area under the curves is still the same. We've just shifted the distribution um, towards the lower energy side. And we'll do the same for a higher temperature. So instead of pushing the, the wire to the left, to the low energy, we're gonna extend it and give everything high, more energy. And so the curve will do this. neaten that up there we'll do something like that right if we bring the activation energy back in so we'll say that's the activation energy so at the medium temperature so that's the black curve the area under the curve is going to get quite messy this diagram now is all of that At the blue temperature, so that's the lowest temperature, the only particles that can react are these. So I'll just so you can see it a bit better. So it's just these circles, if you like. So that area there, they're the only particles that, that can collide successfully at the blue temperature, the lowest temperature. And if you look at the area under the curve for the red temperature, 
Well, we've got all of this area can now react. So all we've, we've increased the area under the curve after the activation energy. So if I just label these up, so the red is the high temperature, the blue is the low temperature, and the black curve represents the medium temperature. And for the exam, you may have to draw a curve at one temperature, so they're going to be checking your accuracy. So have you started at the origin? Have you made it asymptote? And the other thing is they'll be looking for is if you change the temperature, have you got the proportions right?